Yeah, we're glad you're here this morning, and this morning especially glad because we are talking about generosity. Can I get a woot woo? woo? <laughs> we love to talk about money at church, don't we? Well, that's the kind of the reputation we get. We all, you know, if you ask anybody on the street, they'll tell you that's all you guys ever talk about. But I don't think, you know, yes, we ask for offerings, this and that. I get that, but we don't really talk about it. And you know Jesus, he talked about it a lot. So if he can talk about it, I figure we can talk about it too. Well, the reason we're talking about it is because it's one of our core values here at Our Savior's Baptist Church. And uh, what I've done is created for you the list of our core values for our church. Just as a reminder, something maybe you want to keep in your in your Bible, you maybe want to post it on your refrigerator, uh, you know, do with it as you will. But uh, this is who we are as a church. And just as a reminder, you can read them there, but uh, also know that uh, here they are for you here. So God's word, we align our lives with God, being transformed by the study, the teaching, and the application of the Bible. That's where we started. God's word is the foundation for all we believe. So we start with God's word. The second value is worship. We celebrate the greatness of God through our actions and our attitudes. It flows out of us into the world around us, both individually and as we gather as a church family. Because worship is both corporate, coming together as a church family, and individual as you live your lives. Third one is prayer. We spend time with God, acknowledging our need for His reign in our lives and the world we live in. Now, these first three, again, kind of point us back to the, the reality that we love God. We love God with all of our heart, with all of our soul, with all of our mind, with, with all of our strength. And then the second command is like it, Jesus says, and that's to love your neighbors as yourself. So these next three kind of unpack that a little bit. So we talk about love. A few weeks ago, we, uh, we had a sermon on love. It's about reflecting Christ's love to all people accepting people where they are, walking together toward the full realization of God's plan. You see, we are in process, and we are becoming a little bit more like Jesus. It takes time, so it takes investment of other people. So we walk with others who are far from God that we might bring them near to God, which then brings us into fellowship. Once a person has accepted Christ, then they enter into the fellowship, the body of Jesus Christ. So a fellowship is we spend time together, Time is so important. Time is what we do together. It's, and quality time is an accident of quantity time spent together. So we spend time, and sometimes we get some quality time out of that. So we spend time together valuing the participation and accountability of others in our lives. And then today we are talking about generosity. And generosity, this is how we define it, is we sacrificially invest our lives and resources to address the physical and the spiritual needs of our community and world in the name of Jesus. So, so a couple weeks ago I was explaining, and maybe you weren't here, but I was explaining that the process for us to come up with these values was really more about archaeology than it was architecture. In architecture, you design the building, you create the building. In archaeology, you unearth the structure that already exists. So these core values were values that already existed. It's not that we, as this group of leaders who got together, we aren't imposing these on the church, but we spent a lot of time digging and wrestling and having conversations about what these values were. Uh, and a lot of coffee too. But it took us some time, it took us a weekend, and we came up with these, that these identify who our Savior's Baptist Church is. It's not who we aspire to be, it's not what we hope we will become, it's to identify this is who we are. So today, it's especially important in that context to understand that what we're saying is that you should be, we're not saying you should be generous, it's us saying, it's me saying to you, we are generous people. You are a generous people. Our Savior's Baptist Church is a generous church, and you are distinctively generous. And the world, when they look at us, there's something about that that they notice. You are a distinctively generous bunch. And I've heard stories from some of you who've had conversations with others, and they say, really, that little church up there has that large of a budget? And it's not because the budget's so large, but because the generosity is so great. And uh, in comparison to this other church that was saying, a large church who, whose people just were 
all the time pulling teeth to try to get them to give. But that's not you. That's not this church. So we're going to talk about this idea of generosity, and we're going to look at it from the book of Luke. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to the book of Luke, Luke chapter 19. If you don't have a Bible, there's a pew Bible right there in front of you. It's page 1039, 1039 in the pew Bible. So turn over to Luke chapter 19. So beginning at verse 1, now this, the heading kind of gives it away. You've probably seen it there. It says, Zacchaeus the tax collector. So beginning at verse 1, we read this. Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. A man was there by the name of Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was wealthy. He wanted to see who Jesus was, but because he was short, he could not see over the crowd. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore fig tree to see him since Jesus was coming that way. And I know that you've all heard the song, right? Zacchaeus was a wee, wee little man. What a wee little man was he. You know it. He climbed up in the sycamore tree for the Lord he wanted to see. Yes, you have been to Vacation Bible School. I'm very proud of all of you. Good job. Now, so you know the song. And you know basically the story. Zacchaeus was a short little man, which is interesting that that's why he should be known. I mean, he's known as short. What we don't realize is, well, he was a tax collector. He was a chief tax collector. So he wasn't just a tax collector, but he was a tax, tax collector in charge of other tax collectors. And I don't know what it is about the tax man, but if you got a phone call and it says, hello, this is the IRS, first you're going to think, is this a scam? I mean, that's the way things are in our world today. But then you're going to say, the last person I want to talk to is the IRS man. Because we just don't have this favorable disposition towards the tax man, towards the tax agent. And that's what Zacchaeus was. But he wasn't just a tax man. He was the chief tax man. And so he was in charge of other tax collectors. Now, tax collectors, they were part, they were employed by, by the oppressive Roman government. So there was this regime. And many of them were Jews themselves who had sold themselves out to the Roman government instead of pushing back against this oppressive government of Rome. They said, I'm going to go into partnership with them. And then they would extort the people and they would say, you know what, um, you owe us this much money. Now the amount that was required to be collected was determined by Rome, but the amount that could be collected was not. So the tax agents would take more than was, what was required and that's how they made their living. So if they wanted to become rich, they would collect that money above and beyond what was expected of them and they would extort people for their money. So Zacchaeus, this chief tax collector, I like how Kent Hughes puts it. Puts it. Kent Hughes is a pastor out of Wheaton uh, Bible Church, I think, out in Wheaton, Illinois. He says, he may have been a wee little man, but he was the kingpin of the Jericho tax cartel. He was a filthy, rich little guy, this Zacchaeus. And maybe the song should have been, Zacchaeus was a slimy little man. What a slimy little slime ball was he. You know, because he was slimy. He cheated his friends and his family. He cheated all so he could live in luxury. That's probably how the song should have gone. Instead, we have this cute thing about him being wee and tiny, but the thing was he was a jerk. So this begs the question, why would Zacchaeus climb a sycamore tree to pursue Jesus? Well, before we answer that, go back in your Bible, just one chapter four, uh, earlier to Luke chapter 18, and Luke 18, beginning at verse 18, it says this, a certain ruler asked him, that is Jesus, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good, Jesus asked, and, Jesus, and he goes on, no one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. You shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not give false testimony. Honor your father and your mother. All these I have kept since I was a little boy. Now do you hear the little bit of self-righteousness in his voice? Oh, check, got that one. Check, 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 did all those. I'm set, I've got it figured out. And when he heard this, 
sorry, back up. When Jesus heard this, he said to him, you still lack one thing. Sell everything you have and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. <laughs> and when the man hears this, it says that he became very sad because he was very wealthy. So he'd done all these great things. He had honored his mother and father. At least that was his claim. He saw, he saw no real spiritual deficit in his life, but he loved his stuff. And God, or Jesus, says to him, he says, sell it. And why does he do that? Because he knows what has got a hold of this man's heart. And what has a hold of this man's heart is his stuff. And then he goes away downcast. And then verse 26, those who heard this asked the question, who can be saved? And Jesus replies, what is impossible with man is possible with God. Actually, verse before that was to say that uh, how hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. Indeed, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle. And maybe that's why we get the emphasis that Zacchaeus was a wee little man, because maybe it only takes a wee little man to go through the eye of a needle. I think there's a little play on the words, but I don't really think that's the point. But there is this idea, here's this rich man, Zacchaeus, very wealthy man is how he's identified, and we've got this other rich young ruler who goes away down, heart, downtrodden and sad and disappointed. Two rich men, two different responses to the kingdom of God. So what is it that finally brings Zacchaeus to this place of pursuit while the other guy goes to a place of departure? You know, it's interesting that the two words miser and miserable come from the same root words, misery and miser. We're inclined to think that wealth brings happiness, aren't we? But when you get miserly, you grab and you seek all this stuff. I've told you before the parable of the, how to trap a monkey. You, you, you take a coconut and you hollow out the inside of the coconut. You put a chain on the backside of the coconut, tie that to the tree, not a chain, a rope or whatever, and you tie that to the tree. But you put a shiny little object inside the coconut. And the monkey, he reaches his hand in and then he grabs a fist. And when he grabs his fist around that shiny little object, he can't get his hand back out of the coconut. But he will not let go of that shiny little object for the life of him. So he holds on and he can't get his hand and he's pulling. And then the natives come by and they club him on the head and they have monkey soup. Why? Because he wouldn't let go of that shiny little object. So often we want to hold on to that. And that was the story of the rich young ruler. He couldn't let go of the shiny. But here's Zacchaeus. And he's looking around back in Luke 19, verse 5. It says, when Jesus reached that spot, he looked up. Do you see the difference? Zacchaeus was looking for him, but Jesus stops and he looks. So it's not that Zacchaeus was looking for Jesus, but Jesus was looking for Zacchaeus. And there he saw him, a man who was looking for him. And the two of them, their eyes meet. And Jesus says to him, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. And so he came down, and when, Jesus, when, when Zacchaeus came down, they went to their house. And what's the reputation? He has gone to the house of sinners. I don't know if it was a loud statement or if there was just murmurings on the side, but they said, look at this guy. Who is this Jesus that he should go to this IRS agent's house, that slime ball that he is? And I suspect that Zacchaeus had heard the people as well. And Zacchaeus probably had heard that numerous times before. He had understood what people thought about him. And he knew that in his heart that they were right. His life had been marked by lies and deception. He had cheated people out of their life savings. And verse 8 says, Look, Lord, here and now I give half of my possessions to the poor, and if I have cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times this amount. It wasn't some feigned apology. It wasn't some attempt to try to make amends, but it was the realization that he indeed was in need of repentance, to turn back from his sinful ways, to give back everything. He knew that it was going to cost him everything he had to follow Jesus. So he gave half to the poor and he made amends with the people around him. 
And Zacchaeus was transformed from sinner to at least on his way to being a saint. That's the process of sanctification, that we're made holy. We become a little bit more like Jesus as we go through life. But there was this moment in his life where everything he owned was no longer his, but given to the Lord. You know, we all come to this place in our lives where we're trying to pursue God and hold on to stuff, and we just simply can't hold on to stuff. Generosity is a sign of a saved life. When we receive Christ, we realize what Christ has done for us, and out of that, we give generously what we have for the sake of others. Followers of Jesus Christ are generous with their time, with their talents, with their treasures. You're generous with your cars, you're generous with your homes, you're generous with your food, you're generous with your giving. Generosity just exudes from you because it's now part of your Christ nature in you. Again, to our value, generosity, we sacrificially invest our lives and our resources to, the, to address the physical and spiritual needs. Not just spiritual, but physical as well. Not just physical, but spiritual as well. The needs of our community and the world in the name of Jesus. Not in the name of ourselves so that we should get some sort of glory from it, but in the name of Jesus. So what do we do? We sacrificially invest our lives and our resources. When we give generously, when we give sacrificially, there's some, there are some incredible side effects. Now, I... When you think of side effects, you think of those commercials, right? You say you have eczema or something like that, and then they have the ad on television. It says, this could cause loss of hearing, loss of life, loss of limb, you know, although not necessarily in that order. But, you know, there's this guy talking 1,000 miles a minute down at the bottom, and that's what we typically think of side effects. But we're going to look at some positive side effects this morning of generosity. And the first positive side effect is generosity may lead to intimacy with God. You know, they always say that, and there's, uh, use of this product may lead to this. So generosity may lead to intimacy with God. It's no guarantee. You can be generous and still not find intimacy with God. Now, when we're talking about intimacy with God and generosity from a Christian perspective, we are doing that in the name of Jesus, not in the name of ourselves. So it will, as Christians, lead to intimacy with God. In Psalm chapter 24, verse 1, it says, The earth is the Lord's and everything in it. We just read it here just a little bit ago. Because what we understand is everything on this earth belongs to God. And that includes not just your resources, but your abilities. It refers to your own gifts and strengths. All of those things are a gift from God to you. Some of them are things like your home and the food and the car that you have. I remember the time that I was in Lincoln, and I, I had gone down there when I was still in the Air Force, and I was working through evangelism explosion, and I come to this gas station, and this guy, you know, there's this fight that ensues. I think I've shared this with you, where the guy gets out of the car, and this other guy gets out, he takes the, the, the pump, the gas pump, and he begins using it like brass knuckles, hitting this other guy with it, and then he takes the gasoline and and soaks the guy, and then pulls out of, out of his pocket, he reaches in and pulls a lighter, holds it into the air. Those guys left quick. The guys that were antagonists, they left quick. It was me and the one guy left. The friend, the friend of the guy who was holding the lighter, he and I were left inside the gas station. I was in Lincoln. His friend was from North Omaha. His friend is gone. I said, you know what? I'd be happy to give you a ride. I'm going back to Offutt. I got it, so I'm heading that way anyway. So why don't, uh, why don't you just ride along with me? And I remember saying that, not to boast of my own things, but say, this car that I have, it's a gift from God, so let me give you a ride to North Omaha. And that's the attitude that we should have. We should be willing to give of our time and our resources that we might be able to help others in the name of Christ. Generosity does help others, but it also leads us to an intimacy with God. 
And because we are giving in the name of Christ, we understand that everything we have is a gift from God. And we get this attitude of gratitude in our hearts because God has given us, which helps us to love God a little bit better because of everything that he has given us. Imagine if some guy came up to you and says, I have here a debit card. I'm going to put $5,000 on that debit card for you. Because I'm limited in the places I can be. So I want you to be my hands, and I want you to be my feet. I want you to be my eyes, the boots on the ground. And I want you to go look for the needs of the people around you. And as you see needs of the people, I want you to meet those people's needs. So you're thinking, this is fantastic. And then you go to the grocery store, and you're sitting there, and you see a woman at the checkout line, and she's digging through her purse, and she's starting to have to put things back because she doesn't have enough money to pay for the groceries she needs. And it's nothing extravagant. It's milk. It's bread. Just the daily things. And then you say, here, step aside. Come with me. Let's go through the aisle. Show me the things that you need. Do you need this? Is this something? Well, that's, it's, it's cereal, and that's sugary cereal. Is no, no, let me give that to you. And you put it in her cart, and you go down the aisle, and you find something else. You know, here's some canned meats and, and all these things, and you load the cart up. You go get another cart. You bring it over, and so you've got two carts now, and you're pushing through, and you go up, and you ring, ring up the items, and you pay for it. And this woman is ecstatic. Oh, my goodness, how great that is, what you've done for me. But you know that it's nothing that you've given. And so you give credit not to yourself, but... I'm happy to be the one to do this for you. And then maybe you see a homeless man on the street, so you go get some cash out of the debit card, and you say, here, let me buy you lunch, and you tell him about Jesus, and you change his life. And you have all these opportunities to take the resources, and then what happens, you go a month, you know, two weeks later you go and you meet with a guy, and you tell him, oh my goodness, the things that we were able to do. I helped this woman, I helped this person. This person was stranded, couldn't get home, so I put gas in their car. All the stories that you have to tell, and you're excited, and then the person who gave you the debit cards, that is awesome, tremendous. Next thing you know, you go and look at the balance, thinking you're about to run out, and the credit card has been renewed, refilled, another $5,000 in there. He says, keep doing it. And you meet every couple weeks, and you get to tell them, oh my goodness, the lives that were changed because of the money you gave me. And you get this relationship with this person that is a deep, meaningful, because you've been able to use their resources to bless other people. The people were blessed, and you were part of that, and you're so excited. You know, that's what God does for us. He gives us resources, and his mercies are new every morning. And every day we have opportunity, and we go out and tell others. And then we go back and we report to God, God, can you believe I had the opportunity to share with these people to make a difference in this person's life because of what you have given me? And your intimacy goes deeper day by day, moment by moment. Generosity creates intimacy with God because we know that we are sharing in his goodness as vessels, as agents to share with others what he has given to us. Another thing that generosity benefits is a healthy self-image. And here's what I mean. Generosity is it's simple, really. When you're, when you're generous, you don't think about all the things that possess you. You don't have time to think about keeping up with the Joneses. You don't have time to think and worry about what you want, but instead you're thinking about what you can give and what you have to offer. In Matthew 6, Jesus says, Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and vermin, I love that word, those vermin, those dang vermin. Isn't that the name of the mascot up in South Dakota? No, something else. Uh, but where moth and vermin destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moths and vermin do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. Do not store up for yourself these things on earth, but store up. For others. Do not store up for yourselves. And that's what we want to do, right? We got these hands full of give me, give me, give me, give me, hands full of grab. And we're consumed by ourselves. But a healthy self image is not one that is consumed by self, 
And that's the irony here. The more we think about ourselves, the worse our self-image becomes. Because we begin to measure ourselves up to other people. And you want more because they have more. And because they have more, you assume that you are lesser because of it. But when you begin to think of yourselves, of what you have to offer, all the riches that God has poured out on your lives, and the things that you can offer back, you begin to get the positive self-image that comes from service to God. Living for others gives us purpose, it gives us meaning, it gives us direction, it gives us value. Focusing on others, or focusing on ourselves just leads to chasing our tails. Because we never get to the place where we are satisfied. Until we are satisfied with what we have, we give to others. Because we give to others, we become satisfied with what we have because we realize how much we've got to offer. Which ties closely to generosity may lead to love for others. Generosity creates intimacy with God. It creates this positive self-image. But I've been on numerous trips to Guatemala, Dominican Republic, Mexico. And you go down there and there's a tendency when you're taking mission trips for the participants to kind of get this attitude. It's like, here we are, the great white hope. Coming to you to save the day. Da, da, da. And you get this attitude that we have so much to offer these other people. And then something happens in the middle of those mission trips, and then you realize how much those people have to offer to you. They don't have the riches that you have. They don't have the resources available to them. But despite the fact that they may live in poverty, there is a joy that they have that is so much greater than the joy that you have. And their love for Jesus seems to far exceed your love for Jesus, even though you have been given so much. And yes, you're able to come in for a few weeks and make a difference in their lives, to build them a home or to provide them a vacation, Bible school or whatever. But your hearts begin to break for those people that you serve, and your love for those people continues to go deeper. So generosity leads to intimacy with God, healthy self-image, love for others. And generosity is a picture of the gospel. In 1 Peter chapter 1, it says, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. And into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. Going back to Jesus, stop investing in the things that the moth will destroy, that rust will take away, the things that will disintegrate. You have been given an inheritance that will never perish, spoil, or fade. In Christ, there is a hope that we have to offer. In Christ, there is a promise of this inheritance that is unimaginable. And we're not talking about health and wealth and prosperity. We're talking about hope. And there is no greater hope that is found than that hope that is found in Jesus Christ. In Psalms it says, some trust in horses, some trust in chariots. You may trust in strength, but strength will fade. Some trust in riches, and that too will disappear. But the hope that is found in Christ is an eternal inheritance. And so we invest in our lives and re we invest our lives and our resources into, into the lives of others. We live a generous life because of those, the benefits that we get, but most of all because Christ, who was gracious to us, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us to give us an inheritance that does not perish. For those who were far from God, he draws us near. There is hope in Jesus. And again, let me go back to our Savior's Baptist Church. And let me say again that the value of generosity isn't one that we are hoping for here. The intent of this message is to say, you need to get with it. That was the last three weeks. This is one that we say that we are a generous church. On average, within the Church of the United States, on average, about 50% of all Christians give some. So only half of the Christians out there who claim the name of Christ actually 
contribute to the work of ministry through the local church or, or in other means. At Our Savior's Baptist Church in the past year, 80% of you have given something to the church. Almost half of you have given more than $1,000 to the ministry, and, almost, and, and many of you have given far and above beyond that. As a church, we've given over $20,000 to support missionaries across the globe. This past year, we started this campaign for facility improvements, the R3 campaign, which is to re uh, revitalize the facilities, to reduce the debt, and to redeem lives. And through that, you have given a great deal of money. We're almost $20,000 that we have given to the R3 campaign. Our goal is $50,000. But because of that $20,000 we have received in just a few weeks, the landscaping is about to get done. And because of your generosity, the landscaper saw the generosity and responded in kind and gave us this incredible discount so that he too could be generous. And through the, the contagiousness of the generosity, we got a great deal on some really awesome landscaping. In fact, let me give you a couple pictures of what it may look like. This is what, uh, there's a few things changing, like there's one tree there, be one less tree. Uh, but, uh, so south side, north side. Sounds like turf wars now, doesn't it? But uh, because of your generosity, we're able to improve the facilities around here. Because of your generosity, soon we'll be starting on some of the updates in the, in the lobby. And as you, we continue to see your generosity flow, and I know some of you have made regular gifts. Some of you have um, online set up regular giving because that's going to continue. It's allowed to do improvements of uh, the the window treatments here are going to be updated. The church is going to be painted. We're going to do some more acoustical work down in the multi-purpose room. All because of your generosity. But it doesn't stop there. Your generosity goes to your time as well. Every week, this church of around 100, little over 100 people that comes every week, we have 133 volunteer positions that are filled. That math's kind of crazy, isn't it? So every week, 133 volunteer positions are filled by a church of 100. It's pretty impressive. You are a generous people with your times and your talents and your treasures, and let me encourage you to continue to do so. In John chapter 13, verse 15, it says, I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. And that's the story of when Jesus was washing the feet of his disciples. He says, just as I have served, you have served. The gospel there of Christ who came out of heaven and are taking on the form of the servant, that he should come and be our servant, that we who were far from God might be saved, that we might receive the inheritance. That is the kind of life that just as Jesus has done, we should do for others. That others might know the goodness of the gospel because of your generosity, that we might meet their physical and their spiritual needs through our generosity, and we will continue to do so. This week, I read an article about uh, the new park. It's a nature preserve between um, Pacific and Dodge Street, about 162nd. And here's what was interesting to me is they talked to the donor's brother, and they said, it doesn't surprise me at all about their generosity. And here's what I hope is true for us. When people hear that we're from our Savior's Baptist Church, they say, well, it doesn't surprise me at all about their generosity. They are a crazy, generous people. They are sacrificial in their giving. And they shouldn't be surprised because that is the nature of the gospel, that Jesus was generous. And because of his generosity, we are equally, crazily generous. So let us be known among our community, as a people who are generous. Will you pray with me? Lord, I do thank you for those who have already given sacrificially to missions, to uh, the improvements here around the church, of their time, so many who give so many hours to see the gospel go forward. And may we meet the physical and the spiritual needs of our neighbors. 
of our community, whether through benevolence or through missions or whatever it might be, Lord. May we be a generous people. And may the name of Christ be proclaimed because of the generosity of our Savior's Baptist Church. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.